Chapter 6 The Muggos Antikythera had previously opined to Commissar de Laclos what a shame it was that his small complement of Skatari aboard ship lacked the strength and numbers to pursue a tech scouring of the wreckage below. Corsairs, pirates, and the like, foul Xenos though they are, usually serve as treasure troves of valuable spoils from the edges of imperial space. Of the Astra Militarum assets aboard ship, Commissar de Laclos is one of the only officers with private clearance to access the ship's astropathic choir. A quiet message was sent to the brigadier and his own superior officer, Lord Commissar Braden, extolling the virtues of bloodying the new troops, equally as a matter of morale and an opportunity for the newest recruits to gather some practical experience. The order to attack had come back almost instantly. The Muggos has almost been polite in extending an invitation for Commissar de Laclos to join him at their forward observation post. So polite, in fact, that he'd used his monotone flesh voice and extended a mechanical claw to grasp the Commissar's hand and thanks. The Commissar had leered excitedly as his own mechanical appendage met the Muggos's. Only a matter of hours have passed since the second have commenced their assault, and the adepts of Mars have been quite busy, indeed. Plasticine shelters are erected by servitors. Equipment is installed, including a filtration unit and an overpressure system. A landing zone appears from out of thin air, and waves of Skatari deploy as one lifter after another delivers heavy payloads, excavators, seismic cutters, and more sophisticated equipment so precise and esoteric he couldn't begin to name it. Different Auspex apparatuses are aimed at the crash site. Some communicate with binaric blasts and others communicate with picked screens that look to be a thermal map. Displays are joined to a master control and different filters are applied. Augmetic eyes greedily survey the data many machines are returning. Additional filters project different densities of alloy, chemical reactions, structural design, and heat exchangers. The commissar watches this and sees nothing of any tactical value. He chortles slightly. Even amongst all the wind-blown ash without, the forward command post is suddenly sterile. It smells slightly of ozone. Soft, even lighting illuminates the work taking place. Somehow, the commissar knows the lighting is only for his benefit, an example of manners. They certainly don't need assistance seeing in the dark. The commissar raises a silk cloth to his mouth to keep out some of the ozone. The gesture is one of disdain, but this is lost on the Muggos. The attack plan, as written and executed by Tyrion, was bold. A brutal one-two punch with gunship sorties deploying airborne units at four locations, with ground mobile forces coming in hard and fast to reinforce and overwhelm Zeno's positions. Reports coming in from the field communicated how tenuous the situation was. Captains are dead all over the assault. A very public and frankly embarrassing performance. Still, all combat looks like this for a while and sometimes the fog of war parts and somebody has won through as if that was the plan all along. In a conflict of any meaningful scale or duration, anomalous events certainly had to occur. Muggos, if I may, Delaclos speaks aloud. I was wondering if I could beg your indulgence on a matter? Yes, Commissar. Megos Antikythera replies without hesitation, though he's supervising at least a hundred different data feeds at once. How may I be of service? Gingerly, almost reverentially, de Laclos opens his holster and removes his plasma pistol. At the Scola, he was given many gifts, the greatest of which was the absolute authority to dispense the emperor's justice when and where he likes, with total impunity. But there was a price for this, his own history. The mindscaping had made him a stranger to himself. The deacons had been judicious in this regard. But what would have been sufficient for the son of a mere adept, or the bastard daughter of a priest, was utterly meaningless to de Laclos, his line was far too grand. He left the Scola with two facts, his family name, and that he was Terran. He hadn't even been a full commissar by the time he'd figured it out. But lacking something tangible, something physical to bind him to his extinct family, it was all superstition and hearsay. And then, sent to him by parties unknown, his birthright, tangible proof, sealed away within a gene-locked weapons crate. Hydraulic seals snapped open. Smoking cooling agents poured out across the flagstone floor. And his plasma pistol was revealed to him. I have acquired this pistol. A matter of some passing curiosity to me, de Laclos says. I was curious if you couldn't tell me of its origin. The Muggos, blessed with the ability to be in many places at once, glides towards the commissar as if floating. 
With delicate manipulators, he accepts the weapon. Hidden sensory apparatus drink it in. This is old, indeed, Commissar. At least six millennium. Different fixturing tools appear on the Mugosa's mechanandrites, and many steel tendrils begin working at once as the pistol comes apart. Cowlings are removed, followed by piles of wiring harnesses. Ancient pins are drifted out, unlocking motivator chambers and ceramite cooling rings, and then the weapon's equivalent of a barrel. This is all laid out respectfully on a nearby work surface. There is a hairline fracture on this third heat sink, the Mugos indicates flatly. I do not possess any spares, but you should be sure to replace it soon. A boar snake whirs and plunges into the barrel, inspecting it at the microscopic level. The Mugos ejects a single grain of soot. Finally, with a small atomizer, the Mugos sprays the barrel with acid, dissolving the accumulated verdigris. The light green wave of scouring laser returns it to forge new, revealing the maker's mark. Ah, uh, the Mugos says, his equivalent of unrestrained intrigue. Does it signify anything? This weapon comes from the forge of Archmugos Glenda Tershimax. She lived until the end of M36. My local database on this information is incomplete. However, this variation here, the Mugos indicates two small rockers at the bottom of the mark. This isn't the stamp used on her mass production efforts, but a bespoke production. Tershimax was renowned for the quality of her bolt pistols and made only three plasma pistols in this way. This Antikythera illuminates the grip with a red laser indicator, is a standard small size pistol grip. For a woman's pistol. Of the three plasma pistols manufactured, only one was gifted to a woman. Lady Solar, and later High Lady of Terra, Hortensia O. Laclos. And after so long, there it is. My records are incomplete, the Mugos demurs and reassembles the pistol. I can only say this with 97% confidence. Blacklose holds his hand out, and the Mugos presses the reassembled firearm back into the palm of the Commissar's Augmetic. Thank you, Magos Antikythera. A soldier of the second storms in through the vestibule insulating the workspace from the outside. She's a jump trooper armed with a meltagun. Clearly, she's been through it. She's covered head to toe in ashen mud. Trooper, Delaclos asks from a place of surprise. Sir, Commissar. She goes rigid and makes a salute. He waves this off and bends to retrieve a flask from his boot that he tosses to the trooper. Still in shock, she appends the draft. Calmly now, trooper, Delaclo says. What's happened? The assault is broken. Tanks are all slagged. Teakin and Princeton are dead. The company is in full retreat. The tanks are all slagged, sir. They came out of the ash like a nightmare. We couldn't stop them. And there's nothing between the Xenos and your position here, sir. Delaclos nods along and raises a staying hand. Teakin, that means D Company. What of your company, Sergeant Straken? She takes another nip off the flask and then shakes her head. I don't know, she exclaims as her calm decouples. He's down in the field. We were lucky to get out with our lives. But then, he says, smiling ear to ear, who gave the order to retreat? Her eyes go wide and she turns to run. And here I thought the day couldn't get any better. He mutters to himself as he draws forth his utterly priceless pistol. With a pinky finger extended like he's attending a high tea, he shoots her once in the side of the head. She flops down like she weighs 3,000 kilos. Pieces of kit catch fire. Fat bubbles and hisses like something from a rendering plant. Already, a servitor is stripping her corpse of salvageable kit and packaging it into a spare crate. The carcass is hauled outside. Blacklose turns the pistol in his hand to admire it. Commissar, the Mugga says from behind, and D. Laclos turns. If there is any shock or revulsion hidden within the Mugos's face or tone, Dilaclos can detect none of it. There is a radiological alarm, the Mugga says in a droning monotone. Your flesh is not hardened. Please seek shelter, my friend. With the tails of her blue coat whipping in the wind, Major Sia Poo bounds from cover to cover, her Vox operator no more than a half pace behind her. The surviving officers of her cavalry assault follow, pistols out, but their arms are unequal to the skirmish line before them. Jousting weapons fire crosses over a space of terrain that can be neither defended nor taken. Litter bearers race through the furrowed mud, the stretchers slung between the runners carrying the wounded of the assault. 
E-Company, under Tyran's direct control, are dug in, trying to throw back the most recent Xeno sortie. The dead and dying lay everywhere. A soldier, profiled to the mud, begins to drown. A team of stretcher bearers race after his muffled calls for help, and they are riddled with Xeno's munitions. Cut to ribbons, the stretcher bearers collapse in gruesome chunks. No visibility past 50 meters, save the odd halo around Lost Fire careening through the dark. This battlefield is as dark as any starless night. Windblown ash scouring every surface, atomized mud fills their throats, the vaporized detritus of a murdered planet. She takes up the horn off the Vox man orbiting her. A company stand by to reinforce on my command, she shouts into the Vox handset. She resets her footing and then bounds forward another five meters to the next furrow in the wet ash. She pops her head out of cover, audits the battle line quickly, and ducks back down with her hand held out until the Vox horn is placed within. B Company, do you copy? Captain White, answer God damn it. Nothing. Sergeant Terry's. Jillian, answer. This is Penderson, 3rd Platoon, comes the reply. What's the status over there, Lieutenant? White's dead. Emperor's throne, they brought us in hot. We've established a base of fire. I'm trying to get a squad through to the jump teams to reinforce them, but I don't know if we can mount another assault. Just hold on. These Xenos had been a hardy foe. And if they hadn't been vile Xenos, she would have found herself respecting the tenacity of their defense. For officers charging alongside her had died, the remaining more brave for it. It had been a poor trade for the cannon emplacement they had destroyed. The officers around her would have some additional experience, which had been the driving point. Yet it hadn't been the only point. She'd needed the insight into how Terran waged war. She shakes the shame hanging on the edge of that rationale and returns to the Vox. D Company status. Sergeant Straken. Captain Teetkin. A burst of static answers, likely from some trooper's personal Vox. Pure chaos. The captain's wasted. We're all gonna die. She swears and collapses back into cover. More and more, she accepts this as something dangerously close to matter of fact. So few captains return from engagements. And the officer's corps was so thin compared to the NCOs. Worse than their casualty rate, so few officers prove capable of completing their objectives. This was the primary concern driving her to leading a handful of Aoki junior lieutenants into harm's way. C Company, do you copy? Sia calls into the Vox at the edge of panic. This is Calico Actual. And, even over the Vox, Captain Judith Lord's competence suits her. Status? We've occupied the designated position. Enemy presence is reduced. Excellent, Sia says, and finds herself smiling into the Vox. Good to hear your voice, Judith. It was something Sia struggles to conceptualize. But to her estimation, an incompetent officer will make bad decisions and get everyone killed. And as competency increased, the quality of decisions increased and the casualty rate decreased. On a battlefield, it was undeniably difficult to judge conflicting priorities and correctly evaluate a rapidly changing risk paradigm. Even well-reasoned, the reasoning itself took time. And that moved counter to their doctrine's demands on speed and fluidity. But in that regard, Captain Judith Lords is an elation, a breath of sweet air to the drowning. Sia would later hear of Judith Lords, her ankle injured from a faulty belaying rope. She'd lay wounded in a field as a sojourner at a picnic in a state of repose, her head resting in the palm of a supporting hand, directing the battle. The enemy position was reduced to zero in under 10 minutes of contact. Crossfires had been established, lines of retreat reduced. Judith Lords was capable of fighting with a fluidity that none could mimic. That was her gift, a freak. She could send ten men into the heart of things, where they really mattered, and unravel a knot that a hundred men couldn't. And she'd done it again here. She killed as many Xenos in those ten minutes as Teakin and White had combined, with the practical decimation of their companies. Which only left E Company around her, hanging on to their position by their skin teeth. Tyrion had personally taken command, keeping Captain Lucas Damon sidelined. Major Pooh knew exactly why this had taken place, and the knowledge frustrates her. Cast into disarray by four simultaneous assaults, she would soon call in a company from reserve to occupy a position between B and E to protect their flanks. And then the new corps would surge forward, decimating the enemy. But it wasn't meant to be. 
a two-tone whine spits from the box. And in response, she clicks her teeth miserably. In the distance, the pace of gunfire has subsided to a handful of measured pops a minute. She stands from cover and moves in a running crouch up to the colonel's position. He stands, a thin silhouetted pole against a blasted wasteland. He looks ragged, favoring a wounded arm. The Xenos are dead in mounds, mostly blasted by gunship weaponry, some by the tracked vehicles to their rear, and many more shot up by good old-fashioned lost guns. But the one at Tyran's feet has been cut nearly in half, a broken shard of Tyran's heavy saber cleaved half through the filthy thing. Colonel, Sia begins and salutes, radiological warning on the command net. We are ordered to pull back. He doesn't respond. He would have heard the same order on the personal vox affixed to his lapel. Instead, he bends to collect the pieces of his shattered blade. Dupont stands nearby, his carbine held at the low ready to cover his commanding officer. Colonel, Sia says again, incrementally louder. The wind has shifted. We are to withdraw. Admech can't pin down a source, reactor failure, munitions cook off, they don't have a lot to go on. A bolt of pink energy streaks across the blackened sky and every soldier on the line seeks cover. Our forces are in position, Sia. Tyrion finally responds. Did you call up a company? We're staged for the final push here. We can have this ship inside an hour. Excised globs of mud begin falling on them, pelting their position. Sia can't imagine that it isn't related to the alarm, but she tunes out this thought. Some of the veterans around them, rich off pilfered gear, begin to don filter plugs or respirators held back from previous operations. The green recruits do without, their eyes looking down like they've done something wrong. Colonel, she says emphatically, in ten minutes we're all going to be puking up blood. And hearing this, Tyrion's face twists. He seethes, he grieves, he rages. Another stretcher bearer bounds past, and Tyrion shakes his head and turns back to Sia. So then we draw hazard suits and have them brought to us here in the field. Sir, we don't have anything like that in inventory. You need to call the retreat, sir. Already, hardened Skatari arms men are moving into positions the second have secured. Blasts of audible binaric static between them are short. Their strength is less than a company and they lack the power to press the assault. If they mean to occupy this position and secure the cordon, any counteroffensive will brush them aside without too much effort. And then the second will have to retake this territory all over again. So, Terran laments, the Navy gets their win. And one way or the other, the Admech will get theirs. But the second, he says bitterly, defeated by the goddamn wind. For a moment he looks like he is about to rage, kick out at some discarded piece of kit, but that doesn't happen. His frustrations wilt impotently. Sometimes she believes this is a put-on, some affectation he leverages for some personal rationale she can't fathom. These bouts of melancholic display are cumbersome. As a commander, care for the men under command must be measured against the desire for victory. Different commanders rationalize it in different ways, each discovered in their own way. In her estimation, there was no balance in this for Tyrion. He feels both desires in the extreme, simultaneous. He is a good commander, exemplary at times. His service record when he had been the regiment's executive officer was nothing short of aspirational. But working closely with him now, she is nervous about any sudden change in his collar. It would be a shame for the soldiers to love their lives too much. Yet it might be catastrophic for an officer to love that soldier's life more than the soldier does. Sia was a great believer in the merits of ferocity. She's aware that her experience is finite, but she'd observed that a determined assault typically meant that fewer soldiers needed to die. Of course, what was best was the unimpeachable tactical acumen that Captain Lords possessed. But that wasn't always possible, so Sia defaulted to ferocity. The men might not love her for it, the way they loved Lords or Hess, yet they do not loathe her the way they despised the pig. Sia pulls in close to her commander, careful to shield her mouth and words from the curious soldiers around her. His face is a fury, passion, rage, all mixed up and confused, expressed as forlorn despair. Mike, the wind will shift again. You'll get your chance. Tara nods and places his peaked cap upon his head. He touches the handset at the lapel of his coat and issues the order to withdraw across the local command net. Tyrion paces away and takes one menacing look at the down Zeno's craft, shrouded in a haze like a mountain range in the distance. 
He turns his back, returning to where Sia stands. He looks formal, now more in command. When the wind shifts again, I'm sending you in first, he orders decisively. I want a tactical disposition operationalized in 12 hours. First deployment window, we take this ship. Orders are relayed across the theater box. Undercover, forward units are recovered by gunships. Troops clamor into remaining chimeras, which then begin to backtrack towards their heavy lander. Sia gestures to her nearest surviving lancers, Joji Sakura and Heinrich Nitminen, to follow into the closest tracked vehicle, a sorry chimera reconstituted from scrap, stitched back together where it had been previously sawn in half by a lost cannon. The lieutenants following her are young, impressionable. She hopes they've taken the proper lesson from this. The ambulance vehicles depart first, followed by the tracked vehicles as the gunships scream off overhead. Within the rattling vehicle, Sia presses her face to the rearward-facing viewport and slides back the heavy peephole. A single chimera remains, waiting for the last possible moment to withdraw the colonel. She is unsure if he does this in petulant defiance of the orders to retreat or in hope for more survivors to appear through the ashen gloom. At last, Dupont nudges him. The sergeant major has the soul of an absolute bastard, but he tenderly steers his commander into the chimera. The boarding ramp closes and then trundles off towards the heavy lander. The loss of life this day, over 160 troops, has achieved no strategic objective. Chapter 7 Few things in the galaxy occupy the same horrific space as an army in retreat. Wounded soldiers spill their awful across the ship's deck as triage medics work to prioritize those that might be saved. Tourniquets are applied, Morpha is administered. But the ship's limited medici facilities remain wholly overwhelmed. Men and women sit dying in the ship's cramped corridors, waiting for their turn to receive medical attention. Blood spreads across hard steel. The toxic stink of a bilge persists. Everyone screams with nothing held back. It's a scene the regiment has acted out dozens of times before. A single dose of Morpha is enough to soothe most pain. A second will assuage mortal wounds. Overdose occurs at three doses and will be fatal to almost any, save perhaps the firmest soldier. Two guardsmen sit against a bulkhead. One is missing an arm at the elbow. The other's leg is broken in three places. There's three doses working between the two of them. The first soldier jabs the second in the ribs and jerks his head towards Terran, presently exiting the Medici with his arm in a sling. What do you call a colonel with a defective reproductive organ? The first soldier asks his mate. In response, the second soldier shrugs and smirking, the first soldier says, General, what do you want me to say? Pigs don't wait in lines. His mate brushes his nose, and their conversation evaporates as Sergeant Major Dupont surveys the wrecked humanity spilling their guts across this filthy hallway. Only a moment later, the colonel and the sergeant major find each other touring the regiments wounded through the makeshift triage facilities. A soldier with a sucking chest wound screams out, then seizes, jerking taut as he begins to hemorrhage with his boots pounding against a bulkhead as he convulses. Terran bends and cradles the man's head as he dies. Moments later, a naval orderly arrives with a gurney. The dead man's remaining kit is discarded into the floor, from boots to canteen to magazine pouches. Somebody will take it, blood stains or no. He is hauled off to the shipboard recycling facility to join the others that died in queue. Though records will indicate they have succumbed to their wounds, it's impossible to certify that every soldier queued for recycling is, in fact, clinically dead when they go into the grinder. Standing, Tyrion sees Dupont in the distance. He cuts his eyes, and they duck off into a side corridor away from the eyes of the soldiers. We've got our medics doing triage, trying to prioritize who gets access to the shipboard facilities, Tyrion begins. They've got fewer than 20 beds. Only two churgeons. No ordo hospitalizer presence to speak of. I've requested aid be sent from the escorts. DuPont nods. He knows this. Lots of survivable wounds are going to become fatal. Sanitation here is for shit. DuPont lights a cigarette as he speaks. You should try and requisition a real medical company. Tyrion shakes his head at the suggestion. We're an aggressive combat regiment. I'd be happier with another rifle company. Or another dozen tanks. As you say, Colonel. DuPont tips the ash from his cigarette and nods. This grok shit tub isn't my fault, Kyle. 
Division billeted us here and deployed us without support. Tyrion pushes his back against a bulkhead with some juvenile anguish on his face, a gesture deeply unbecoming of an officer. You know, Colonel... Being the boss means knowing the job, and at this, DuPont points to Tyrion's shoulder to indicate the blue and red cords, but hesitates at the absent bone-colored cord. Won't happen anytime soon. Two pins in my arm. Staples in my shoulder. Kyle, I share every risk with the men I lead. What is it you think happened here, Colonel? I saw a lot of men get cut to ribbons. Those Eldari weapons. He trails off. They call me the pig, you know? The men. DuPont chains another smoke, and then flipping the spent, but down the corridor, he shrugs. That's not so bad as far as nicknames go. You remember the bowl? Tyrion smiles at the shared reminiscence. Colonel Taurus, Tyrion says with particular flourish. What was he? You think he was catacan? Neck like a demolisher cannon. Carried in a Stardis pattern bolter for all the good it did him. Shot through the face on his first engagement. Dupont clicks his tongue and shakes his head. But he did what every officer should. He led from the front. Kyle, I don't expect every conflict to be some stirring victory. But all this, Tyrion gestures to the dying men in the intersecting hall. It's got to be worth something. We are an assault regiment. We gain a purchase for others to consolidate upon. It's a costly way to do war. We crack the egg. Somebody else gets the yoke. That's the role we fulfill. Meanwhile, for us, nothing but defeat and dishonor. Dupont takes an extraordinarily long drag off his smoke. As Desarians, Tyrion continues, despite our victory, we lose our home. Then the 59th, destroyed fighting the orcs. And then, he trails off, wary of a passing orderly. And now again is the second. Dupont extinguishes his cigarette on the sole of his boot and returns the half-smoked stick to the pack. Colonel, you need to stop this. I can't be your confidant any longer. Maybe it was different when you were a captain. But now, these demonstrations of uncertainty are inappropriate. You play the cards you are dealt, and you play to win. Your command can ill afford another Lady Ingrid. Tyrion bristles at this, and then the moment passes. Tyrion inclines his head, indicating his wounded shoulder. Cheeky bastard called me a monkey. What do you suppose he meant by that? The dead don't get an opinion, Colonel. Dupont shrugs, but it's forced. The Colonel laughs boisterously before walking back out amongst the wounded, Dupont only a pace behind. Fantastic work, men. Tyrion starts. You honor the regiment. You honor your emperor. Plenty more filthy Xenos where that came from. In their wake, a soldier jogs his mate's waist and then points after the sergeant major and the colonel. You see that gap between those two? My boy, that's called the taint. His mate, now green from Morpha, doesn't respond. But Major Siapu does. Very good, trooper. She says, surprising him. Pardon us, major, the soldier fumbles. It's the Morpha talking. Very good stuff indeed. A storm of chaos accompanies the troops as they return to their foul ship. Guardsman First Class Finrithian moves apart from them. The walking wounded, NCOs, and even officers make room for him. As he progresses, the density of casual soldiery lessens as the weight of overhead lights dim. The passageways become narrower and twist into a wretched maze down into the bowels of the ship. Ten minutes after returning his weapon, he has returned to the billet for the snake eaters. A sign marks this out. Special tactic scola, and then just beneath the sign, a bit of graffiti written out. I killed three Xenos with a frag, and then I pulled the pin. Of all the inductees the second draws in, they are the hard cases, the gangers, the murderers, and the deadenders who inducted one step ahead of local authorities. They are hard men with multiple kills across multiple deployments. These are the men that couldn't hack it in straight duty, ill-disciplined malcontents. In these rooms, tattoos of ships or tears are expected, with hair well outside of regulation. There was a lame joke in the air wing, an intel brief leading into a hard day's work. Nine of the ten pilots would probably die. All ten, each in their own measure, would look to their doomed fellows and feel pity for them. The snake eaters told a similar story, one that might even be true. An officer briefs ten drop troops heading off to a bad drop. 
nine of the ten soldiers would probably die. So, the snake eaters would garrote the officer, mutilate his body, and leave it as a warning to the others, and then jump the mission anyway. Vinrithian pushes through the door into rarefied company. Rank means nothing in these rooms. In their squalid barracks, the snake eaters will constantly test each other, setting ambushes for one another and pummeling each other to assert some form of dominance. When he enters, every soldier in that room pushes their back to the wall as fast as possible. Of all the dead-eyed killers in the snake eaters, Vinrithian is the worst, the most vicious, the most brutal. On average, a snake eater is 10 centimeters taller than a line trooper. Next to Vin, even they are minuscule. He's as close to abhuman as a soldier can be and still be considered mainline human. He looks to be 200 kilos of pulped rubber. He is hairless and neckless. Powerful arms and legs protrude from a mammalian cephalothorax. He is a monster in every sense of the word. And almost like he's shy about it, Vin shows as little of his skin as possible. Theirs is a very particular jargon. To jump is the act of deploying from a gunship in a standard vertical envelopment operation, and a soldier that has done this will wear the blue cord at their shoulder. But to drop means to be entrusted with use of the regiment's incredibly finite supply of grav shoots and carapace armor. And demonstrating fitness for this requires two things, a jump and a confirmed kill. Only then will a soldier earn their turn to drop. A company on paper only. They number in the mere dozens. Passing the bunks of drop troops, he moves into the farthest room where even they are not allowed. This is the space where only the skull takers may enter. When he enters, he is in pure black except for the dimly illuminated reliquary of the colonel. Not Lieutenant Colonel Tyrion, the pig, but the colonel, the originator of the special tactic scola, Annika Hess, Lady Death. Her legacy hangs across the regiment, but her absence is felt most acutely here. She had died in the most majestic ways, leaving the regiment reeling in despair and amazement. She'd been replaced by Taurus, who'd been killed almost immediately. Reinforcements were growing spotty at that point, and so Tyrion was promoted. Hess bones are erect in the reliquary, bound together with copper wire and with boughs of dead flowers woven into a crown set upon her smiling skull. Empty eye sockets stare back. Oh, what those eyes might have seen. What viciousness that brain had concocted. There might have been others. Experiments in independent operations that ran tangential to what Hess had unleashed. Certainly, guardsmen Orlando fit in there somewhere. Armed with a flamer, without orders, he'd waded independently into a horde of green skin. After the battle, he had walked out of the fight with a dull combat knife and the knob's severed head in hand. He'd killed eleven green skin that day. And returned alive. He was dead too, of course he was. But his memory endured, the single deadliest trooper in the history of the regiment, and, if the rumors were to be believed, the cause of Commissar de Laclos as augmetic. But Hess had perfected this. It was she who first requisitioned body gloves. It was she who had first worn the death's head mask. The regiment, from form to form, had only launched ten skull-taker missions. There had been an eleventh, wholly unformed and nebulous, where Lady Death herself had become the first of an archetype of those that followed. A pistol, a knife, explosives, and the time and freedom to use them to maximum effect. It was an affirmation of the most accurate sentiment in the Imperial Guard. Heroes are not forged, they are filtered out from the dross. And the Skull Taker is the purest iteration. What comes next is a ritual. With his own knife, he finds a blank space amongst her bones. In life, the woman had been petite so he works with a delicate hand to carve his name into her. He then slices his finger and paints the crude lettering in his blood to highlight the inscription. It's a small cut and quits bleeding instantly. He sheaths his knife and turns to face the darkness. A light flashes from a Promethean lighter and Kyle Dupont's face is illuminated for a moment, replaced by a cherry red glow and a streamer of white smoke. Well, Dupont growls out. How was it? Vin doesn't answer for a moment. He destroyed one of the foul Zeno's automaton. He'd done it with a croc grenade slave to a melta bomb. It was fine. Vin says. Effective, but not revelatory. Up close, I found the Xenos to be quite brittle. Dupont laughs roughly through a breath of smoke, grinding out a laugh like a can of gravel. This isn't a church. We are killers. To be a skull taker is to be recognized as such. And lords capitalized on this. 
The colossal man answers more quickly this time. There was a problem with some jump lines failing. She took a handful of casualties there. Almost none from the enemy. Her assault was without fault. It was immaculate. Dupont grins at the religious overtones. I'm glad to hear that. I'm sure you heard that Chalmers and Wright did not survive their missions. Polsky made it out, just fine. And you should know, Jillian Terry's is dead. He has no response to this. After her time with the Snake Eaters, critical time according to most, Terry's had returned to line service in the regiment. Even in a cohort where death meant nothing, her loss weighed heavily on the shrinking community. I can return you to a line squad. Promote you to a squad leader if you would like. Throne knows we need more qualified sergeants. You could be company sergeant before long. No, Vin says almost abruptly. These are my people. Rank means less to me than the opportunity to serve. Dupont nods, drawing in another breath of smoke. To serve? You mean to kill, don't you, trooper? But good. I'm glad to hear that. Normally, I'd handle this myself, but putting this busted-up regiment back together is going to require my full attention for some time. We've got a lot of green recruits. A lot of NCOs that don't deserve their stripes, and some dipshit junior officers with some terrible ideas that will get a lot of soldiers killed. It is only going to get worse when we link up with the rest of the 426th. Yes, Vin nods solemnly. Guardsmen, I have an opportunity for you. This afternoon, we threw a lot of men out of gunships. A bunch of them survived. Some of them even managed to kill something. You want to stay on for another campaign? I'll get you a billeted here as a trainer. You earned it. Will Lieutenant Galiabev be a problem? Nominally, the regimental executive held command of the Snake Eaters. Once, that had been Tyran. And then Marjorie, and now Sia. They'd come and gone quickly in the last year, leaving a lot of the responsibilities of leadership to Galiabev. Meaning, in reality, that no one was in charge. That little rat? Dupont lights another cigarette. That dumb bastard will keep his mouth shut and keep his head down. Even Tyran has our back on that. You'll have a free hand. And the commissar? Why would he be bothered? This is a legitimate formation, operating under lawful orders. We aren't a death cult, guardsmen. I know, but solemnly. Do you? I'm not always so sure, so let me remind you. We're here to reinvent asymmetrical warfare. The goal, through direct action and training, is to elevate the regiment's impact. The Snake Eaters are to develop new tactics, sow chaos and confusion into the enemy's flanks and rear. We move hard and fast, we turn flanks, so that the enemy reacts to our cadence, to our tempo. And through this, the enemy is defeated on our terms. Dupont stands and strides forward. Vin looms two heads taller than the senior NCO. But the smaller man's eyes contain a cruel cunning that might make it a fair fight. From a plain metal box, Dupont removes a bone-colored cord and affixes it to the giant's shoulder. I'll get you a list of names. Now, let's go kill the Emperor's foes. For the Emperor, Vin says. Yes, the truest and most noble of goals. Publicly, Commissar de Laclos reserves his naked contempt for the Imperial Guard alone, maintaining that the uniformed rightness of the Officio Perfectus is the proper standard to which all soldiers and sailors of the Imperium should be held. But privately, his bias runs even deeper. Yes, he and the young fleet Commissar Oswine, the Grand Rivera's political officer, share several common experiences. They had both survived the Scola, passed into the rigorous Officio Perfectus, and survived untold hazards as cadet commissars. And while he knows this is no simple burden, de Laclos had attended Scola on Holy Terra itself. Every other school was a pale imitation of the genuine article. Far from being his equal, this fleet commissar wasn't worth a shit beneath his boot heel. Nevertheless, such attitudes remain counterproductive. And in a bureaucracy as unwieldy as the Munitorum, much is handled by ways of friendship. One never knows when a personal relationship might be helpful. Careers are made of such relationships as it happens. You suffered five casualties from a belaying ropes failure, the young commissar repeats back, clearly shaken by the statement. Commissars Oswine and de Laclos sit at a table in Oswine's berth, sharing a pot of fine tea. Blacklose indicates the requisition paperwork filled out by the 79th Air Wing's Jumpmaster and the fulfillment forms with requisite inspection certification made by the ship's maintenance crew. I'm afraid so, Delaclose says calmly, including a company officer. 
Holy Emperor, Oswine says and clutches at his chest, sweating visibly. Commissar Oswine, I do hate to lay this on your feet. I represent a guard formation with a naval detachment subordinated that receives maintenance from naval assets aboard this ship. This might take weeks to unravel, but really, something must be done. I would rather go through you than the Admiralty. The young Commissar is trembling. Tremors of rage shudder through him, disrupting his hair. With a gloved hand shaking, Commissar Oswine reviews the paperwork. Work orders are signed and authorized. A junior ensign's signature, Soda Mayor, assigns the work order to a detail and then once more certifying the work's satisfactory completion. A vein begins to pulse on the young man's forehead. It is a bit of an overlap, of course, naval discipline impacting the Aster Militarum. This remains your area of concern, aboard your ship. I would never act alone. And then Delaclos lays out the medical reports. Perfect teeth begin to shatter inside the young commissar's mouth from the force of a clenched jaw. They enter through the central gangway and into the work cell. Equipment and tools hang on every wall, with the majority of the room occupied by steelwork tables. The ratings are a miserable, squalid lot. They are visually bound by some familiar commonality and multiple regressive genes stacking in common features. Oh, and the smell is unimaginable. They are flukes, survivors of some reproductive bottleneck, stirred up from the depths of the ship's putrid bowels. Eyes of a uniform color lock onto the commissars and the ensign accompanying them. It takes a moment for realization to settle in and for those bloodshot eyes to go wide with terror. Ratings fly in every direction, like vermin shut up in a bottle. The commissars draw their weapons and get to work. A steel table flips over as a corpse smashes through it, riddled with holes. A uniformed leadman is shot through his protesting mouth. Oswine moves left, Delaclos goes right. Men and women run for the distant wall, pointlessly. They are taken mid-stride, destroyed heads knocked sideways into bulkheads. Tools fall from pegboard from the force of impact. The ensign accompanying the commissars tries to focus this rampage, to little avail. A woman crawls under a table as if to hide, but she's screaming and Oswine hauls her out by her ankle. He kicks her onto her back and shoots her in the face with his bolt pistol. Black Lowe's, whose aim is remarkable, shoots another man in the base of the neck. He is paralyzed instantly by this and tumbles to the deck quite curiously, his ankles draped above his own shoulder. Black Lowe's shoots him in the face in passing. The last man stands at the far end of the room, penned in between Oswine and Delaclos. Oswine points his pistol, and the man flees towards the other end of the room, where Delaclos points his own pistol, and the man flees in the opposite direction. They bracket him in this manner as the two political officers close in. The rating is rendered insane. Tears stream down his grimy face. He gnashes his teeth and pulls at his hair. After you, Commissar, Delaclos finally says, the epitome of manners. Perish the thought, Commissar. Guests and all that. Delaclos chuckles and shoots the ultimate rating in his eye. Brains boil, flesh burns away. Renault blows gently at his beloved plasma pistol to cool it before tenderly holstering it. Scattered around them, several of the rating's bodies are flaming from the proximity of the violence. Alarm scream, the air thick with the stink of cordite, Blood and brains and viscera is smeared everywhere. Ensign Sotomayor shudders, and with his voice crackling, he speaks. That's all of them. Not quite, remarks Oswine, looking yonder. He kicks the ensign behind the knee, laying him flat. Surprised, Sotomayor looks up and directly into the barrel of Oswine's pistol. Commissar Oswine, with a grin ear to ear, shoots the ensign in the face. Blacklose pats his uniformed midsection. I'm famished. Ready for luncheon? They lay together in their dead squad's berth, everything gray and black and lifeless. Around them, tokens of the squad mates remain. Surplus kit, abandoned socks, illuminator battery packs, stashes of smokes. All this kit retains the stingy scent of the dead. Clammy with sweat chilling their naked bodies, the creaking of their racks still echoes in the empty space. Expressed adrenaline, grief, some internal turmoil had spilled over into their coupling. But there's something else in there, some gene-deep desire to redeem this shared trauma. Crespin rolls her name around his mouth. Maria. His mouth takes on succulent shapes. Maria is dark-haired, 
all flat planes and sharp edges. She's like a hide draped across a tanning rack. She smiles at him, faintly. Well, that was sprightly, she says, somewhat guarded. And because the comment is so wounding, he knows he's made himself vulnerable to her. She says nothing further, and then her bare feet touch the deck. In the dark, the ridge of her spine stretches as she recovers her jumpsuit and pulls it back up her legs and over her shoulders. Crespin knows he's made a mistake here, though likely a common enough one. He can forgive himself for not thinking this through, but he worries her motivations. Thanks for saving my life. How's your uncle? A shadow moves. Crespin looks to the portal to see Sergeant Major DuPont standing there. Quickly, Crespin dons his own jumpsuit and rolls out of his bunk to receive whatever condemnation waits for him, but is shocked by the two officers standing behind DuPont. Both Crespin and Maria stand at attention upon seeing the officers. This is Captain Michael Bladesworth and Lieutenant Laura Lambrecht. They're replacing Teakin and Prince Stone. They're dead, you know. Yes, sir. Unlike his reputation, in that moment DuPont is the epitome of professional dispassion. Guardsman San Baca, Guardsman Panero, command has seen fit to promote the pair of you to sergeant. Sergeant San Baca, you will take over Hidalgo's squad. Sergeant Panero, you're being moved to the company's first platoon. Report to Lieutenant Joanna Case. She'll assign you to a squad. Color Sergeant Straken should be out of hospital within the month. Congratulations. A quick salute is sketched out. The two are handed sergeant stripes by their new company commander. The officer stinks of soap and his uniform is in perfect order. Crespin writes the man off instantly. But with the same instinct, Lieutenant Lambrecht shines for him. Clearly, she's of Aoki stock. There is a disfiguring wound, still wet, running from her face down the nape of her neck and past where her uniform obscures it. At her shoulder, Lambrecht wears the silver braid, the one indicating she's ridden the blues royal. This marks her out as one of Siapu's chosen. It is over almost instantly, and DuPont ushers the officers out of there just as fast as he can, but he lags at the portal, turning back on the pair, his eyes full of disdain. He takes up first her helmet, then his, and quickly scrawls something upon the helmet's cloth cover before returning his attention to them. It smells like a fishmonger's piss spot in here, he says, clean it up. And then he moves along. Vin spends hours at a terminal, reviewing records. The day prior, 66 guardsmen completed a jump. Five of them scored kill. Of those five, three were now dead, with one in critical condition and the other rated walking wounded, light duty. Snake eater recruits need two things. One is a successful jump. Two, a confirmed kill. All considered, this is a poor start to his team. He's logged into the regimental data stream at a bronze terminal under Lieutenant Goliabev's credentials. This is thin cover, but sufficient. If the lieutenant confronts him on this, Vin will break his neck and dissolve his body in vat of acid below decks. And the lieutenant knows this and will shoulder any scrutiny this breach may warrant. What's more, Vin believes Tyrion knows this as well, a deliberate command decision. Meeting this dead end, he goes back in time, to the paper records not yet under inquisitorial seal. These were the troopers that began their service in campaigns with names like Crucible, Roll Tide, White Walls, and the Spool River. He sorts through the files and makes stacks. As he collates and filters his prospects, an officer enters the list, Judith Lords. He sets this file aside without reading it. Officers earn their drop scars in a different way. He returns to the grunts. Anthony, a Gemini, first saw combat under Samuel Nam. Jason first saw action under poor dead Marjorie Saramord. He collected his first kill departing the Spool River right behind Judith Lords. Even by Vin's standards, the Spool River had been no simple day. Sergeant Lucas Indigo made his mark in the same firefight that had killed Colonel Claudius II Taurus. Moody had taken the squad's plasma rifle and gotten a commendation from his sergeant. Then there's Kincaid, another Gemini, overlooked by prior recruitments because he's been reported dead in error, yet her he was again, alive, and well years later. He cheated death, a classical administrative miracle. Then there's Alcola, a meltagunner. The names start stacking up. A good start. A lot of experience in those records DuPont had slipped him. But still, there's something missing that sparked to transform all this raw kindling into something explosive. 
then backtracks to the terminal and filters to the original 66. He expands the data range and on instinct sorts by the timestamp of their discharged dead notation. Of the killed in action, he finds an input error. A Giridsman died in action, two years from now. Somebody made a mistake. She's Aoki with a confirmed kill at the Spool River. Aoki was the final resting place of an imperial saint, and this had left the population in an enduring state of fervor. Not exactly death cultists, but descended of a convergent idea. The planet is slathered with petty nobles who practice a highly codified sort or warfare to occupy the shrine. He sits with this for a moment as her turns back to the cogitator. The regimental data stream is one thing, but the motion picks from the Spool River is kept under lock and key to keep it well isolated from the ship's infosphere. It isn't a very good lock, and he has a perfect key. Vin produces a data pick from his fatigues and slits it into the terminal. He bypasses the credential check in under five seconds into the videographic record of the 232nd. He starts from the beginning, time synchronized, from the point the regiment fords the acidic waters of the Spool River. The pictures are all set at chest height and the cogitator's vid screen puts him into the squad's point of view. It's a poor facsimile, nevertheless, he can feel his body react to the Fantasia. His muscles tense, folding him into a transitive combat stance. His organs dump neurotransmitters into his bloodstream. A sky the color of viscera, a bright and red desert sprawling forth, broken, smoking, and blasted. He scans forward, the multiple viewpoints merge into a single perspective of the day's suffering. They assault into a smoky fog and Vin slows the playback to real speed, not that he could be surprised. He had been there. In moments, 30% of the regiment will be dead. The squad is running. Then a streak of light flares the camera. In its wake, the scene goes red. A mass reactive bolt has hit a member of the squad, spraying blood and viscera across the lens and tinting the scene that follows. With chunky fingers, Vin works the cogitator's dials with the precision of a concert performer. He shifts the point of view and limits the playback to a handful of frames. The images move forward jerkily, the poor quality of the devices showing through as the lighting dims. The images flare, gritty and overexposed in a hail of bolter fire. The next frame, detonation, blood and limbs everywhere. A sudden and violent reorientation of many of the cameras as the squad makes first contact. The runner takes two more strides in the hail of gunfire. A raising arm obscures the camera for a moment as she lifts a rifle to take aim. And then there it is. The Asardis is only just visible through the shroud, sheathed in red ceramite that might be Mark III plate, but it's not always easy to tell. The thresholds on what come next are so small, even at a range of less than five meters. The Astartes is already adjusting his aim. The skulls set into his goal-winged power pack come into focus. The runner fires, anticipating the next bounding leap perfectly. A ribbon of red lost fire races out of the rifle to strike the Astartes in the islands, a common structural weak point of that mark of armor, especially at that age. The lost bolt will lack the strength to exit the helmet and will ricochet around the inside of the helmet, turning the skull to an overpressured soup that pours back out of the shattered eye socket of frame later. He bends the image, changing to perspective to the disemboweled and dismembered ruin of the rest of the squad. And there she is, frozen in mid-pounce, eyes different color from lens flare. She had the bone structure of a little bird, weighing all of 50 kilo. Vin cannot locate her in the common ward reserved for the troopers. It's a corridor junction, with several bunks and gurneys hauled in. At least two of the soldiers are dead and have not yet been removed by the orderlies. For a moment, Vin assumes she has in fact succumbed to her wounds until he hears the commotion coming from the NCO's ward. Turning, an orderly crashes through a curtain wall, hands around his throat, face turning purple. A pair of naval armsmen with stun batons race off, with Finn strolling behind. Rounding the corner, an armsman lays sprawled, writhing in pain, an arm flopping about broken. The second circles slowly, stun batten just so. Opposite him, she prowls with the eyes of a caged animal looking for an opening. Her entire torso is wrapped in bandages like some superstitious funerary spectacle left incomplete. The armsman charges, but telegraphs his strike before he moves. Arm up, he rushes forward for a crude overhead strike. The girl sticks her baton out and he charges straight into it, catching it in his throat. 
He seizes and falls to the floor in convulsions, and she takes up the second baton, searching. He can deduce her objective. And glancing over, he sees the familiar face of Henry Scrabbla, a kinsman from Tallwater. He's alert, a very hard man, but he's taken a rough wound through his thoracic cavity. In one step, Vin is between them. She growls, curling low but not backing down. She pivots her front foot, a solid move that he instantly recognizes as a feign to go around him and straight for Henry. But when she launches, she doesn't go around Vin, she goes right through him. He's caught only slightly flat-footed by that misdirection, but her instincts are uncanny. He catches the baton in his bare palm, shunting the pain away. The octrovolts fly off him, wreathing his wrist in raw electricity. She swings with her other hand. As fast as she is, he's faster. His fist catches her square in the throat. Not enough to damage her airway in any permanent sense, but enough to send her staggering back, choking and sprawling to the floor. Vin stalks forward. Fresh blood streams from her chest wound, a wound that appears to encompass her entire upper body. The pain looks immense, but the eyes are fiery and alive. Anna Ivo Nova, he holds out a massive hand to her. How would you like a transfer? Subscribe. Like. Follow.